All right. Come on back. Here we go. All right. So crowdsourced amateurs. Crowdsourced amateurs, this idea that we can actually create things of value when we work together. Put your teachers to work, right? Not only locally working together to make things of value that might be helpful to others, but how about some cross-school collaborations, right? Let's get you know, a dozen English language arts teachers together from a dozen different secondary schools and have them make something that would be useful to not just themselves, but English language arts teachers in independent schools all over the world. Put your kids to work. What could your ninth graders do that would be useful for fourth graders? Right? What would be fourth graders make that might be useful for ninth graders? Who knows? Right? But you get the idea. Put them to work making stuff and sharing it. This is a sharing space. We, we keep everything so local when we, we have such great value within our institutions. All we do is got to get it out there. And if we don't have the value we need, we can make it and then make it available to others. Those are the capabilities that we have now if we choose to play. Okay, we're talking about congruence. Congruence between our internal learning inf landscapes and information landscapes and the world that surrounds us, right? Here's another characteristic of their new information landscape around us and our learning landscape around us. Did you notice there's a bunch of stuff out there that used to be locked down, that used to be inaccessible, that used to be expensive, and now it's openly accessible and free. Did you notice that? <laughs> Right? This whole idea of open, accessible, and free is huge. This open educational resources movement, OER, is enormous. So many of you are familiar with places like the Khan Academy, right? Where they have screencast tutorials of, for math, and you can supplement or even replace your classroom with it if you feel like it. And they've got you know, assessments that go with it and so on. But we've got all kinds of places like that where we can tap into the world's experts. Right? We've got places like Academic Earth where you can learn from some of the smartest people on the planet. You can go to iTunes U, where universities make their materials available for free. We got other places like Fora TV or Big Think, which are kind of like Academic Earth, right? Tap into the world's great experts. We've got TED Talks and so on. MIT kicked off this whole movement of open courseware, where they would take what they're doing and they'd make all their lectures, they'd video all their lectures and make them available for free. You could. Um, you know, all of their assignments, all their reading materials, all their learning resources, everything attached to the class was available for free. They gave away the entire university for free. You, the learning there was, you know, at your fingertips. You could get your doctorate in particle physics without getting your doctorate in particle physics, right? But you could have all the knowledge. In other words, the learning is free. It's the credential that's expensive. So you could say, yes, I have my doctorate in particle physics from MIT. Well, I mean, I don't have the piece of paper, but I have all the learning, right? I mean, that's, I mean, seriously, what does the piece of paper signify? It signifies that you learned, right? If you have other ways of signifying that you learned, do you have to pay MIT the 32 grand? What if you have a, you know, and most of you are not in this boat, but imagine you're a kid in rural Iowa and you don't have access to an AP, AP physics class. Could you take Physics 1 with Walter Lewin? You could do all the readings and watch all the videos and do all the activities. And you could take the AP exam at the end of the year. If you got a five, should we give that kid credit for college? Yeah, most people say yes. What if he did a dozen of those? Do we admit that kid as a junior? Right? I mean, these are the kind of things that we're starting to confront. Right? We have University of the People, which just sort of takes that MIT open courseware idea and ramps it up to people in the developing world and says, we'll not only give you the learning, we'll actually give you the credential. You know, other than the cost of some learning materials, you can actually get your college degree for free. It's an open educational diploma for people in the developing world. It's kind of cool. And then we have MOOCs. Who knows what a MOOC is? A few of you, a MOOC stands for Massively Open Online Course. The idea sort of stemmed out of Stanford. There's this guy named Sebastian Thrun. He said, let's take one of our computer science classes at Stanford. Think about that for a minute. Computer science class, Stanford, you know it's hard. Right? And he said, let's make it available on the web for free. Right? Like We'll put all our lectures out and all the notes, and we'll create community spaces where people can share notes with each other and dialogue and ask questions and so on. And let's put it out there and see what happens. How many people do you think signed up for a free computer science course from Stanford? That's correct, 125,000. <laughs> 125,000 people all around the world signed up for this course. Unbelievable. Now, at the end of it all, how many people finished? Like, I don't know, 17,000? So, and people are like, oh, how horrible. Look at that attrition rate. It's horrendous. And you know what Stanford said? They said, are you kidding me? We usually have a couple hundred people go through this. We just ran 17,000 people through this learning experience for essentially, you know, the cost was minimal. It was like almost zero. 
Sebastian Thome was so excited, he stepped out and said, I mean, I gotta make a company out of this somehow, right? So Stanford's having trouble wrapping its head around this idea, right? They wanna like attach tuition to it or whatever. And again, you got the learning and the certificate of completion if you finished. But you know, you didn't pay any tuition and so on. So he's now, he's got this company called Udacity where they're trying to figure out how do they make this model work? Learning to the masses at huge scales. Right? MIT took its open courseware initiative. They partnered with Harvard. It's now called edX, and they're trying to do the same thing with these MOOCs. Here's Coursera. It's a couple other Stanford professors that stepped out and said, yes, this is exciting. We're going to try and make this work. And they're pulling in universities like crazy. It started with these four. You may have heard of some of them, Princeton, Michigan, Penn, Stanford. But now they're up to like 25, 30 universities, you know, University of Texas, and so on. I just took a gamification course through Coursera just to see what it was like. 70,000 people were in that course. MOOCs, right, available to everybody. And then there's this sort of more informal learning that's out there where people are sharing their expertise. So you want to learn how to program with the Twitter API, you know, go to peer-to-peer -to -peer university and start connecting with people. You want to learn how to raise seed capital for your startup. You can go to a website like Skillshare and learn how to do that. You want to learn how to play the guitar instead of paying somebody local, you know, 30 bucks an hour. You can learn how to do it watching videos on Mahalo. Uh, you want to learn, you know, about how your body works and various medical things. You can go to explaining.com and look at animated explanations. You want to learn how to mod your bike in crazy ways. You can go to Instructables and, the, and, the, and the, you know, the ways to do that are there. This peer-to-peer -peer learning, this more informal places where we have local expertise, we have knowledge that you know, we typically only share locally. Now we can share it with the world and other people can learn from us and show on these platforms are, create, are growing rapidly. And as Brewster Kale says, you know, the amount of learning that we can create these days is unbelievable. We can literally archive all of human learning, formal learning, informal learning, it's all out there. We could digitize and scan every book for about a billion dollars, every song for another billion, every movie that's ever been made for another half billion. The costs and technical aspects to making this enormous human global information commons are essentially nil. We've got some copyright issues to work through, you get the idea, right? But the bottom line is that open, accessible, and free. And the cool part about it is that this stuff is not just static, like stuff in a textbook, but it's active and interactive, right? We can create games and simulations, so you know we can make chemistry and genetic simulations, these kind of puzzle-like environments like we did with the HIV virus where we solved it in three weeks instead of 10 years, right? We can put people in simulations like Third World Farmer where we can simulate what it's like to be involved in agriculture in the developing world. We can throw students and youth into places like iCivics where you can learn important principles of government and what it means to be a citizen by playing government-related games that were developed in conjunction with people like Sandra Day O'Connor, Supreme Court Justice. Uh, you can put them into simulations like oligarchy to talk about the relationship between oil and the land. You can put them into simulations or games like remission. 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 Remission is a game for kids with cancer. What remission does is that during the course of playing the game, kids actually start to internalize the self-care behaviors that allow them to be healthy. Remission is literally a video game that saves lives. Awesome. Hi. <laughs> We've got simulations like that created by the United Nations for High Commission of Refugees. Right, we say, what is it like to be forcibly displaced from your country because of war or genocide or famine? You have to go someplace else. You have to try and make, you know, find a place to live and get some food and find shelter and go to school and get a job. That's what this, what Against All Odds simulates. Right, we've got course experiments like down in the Florida Virtual School where they're taking their U.S. history course, their full 36-week ninth grade U.S. history course, and they've turned half of it into a traditional online course, you know, just threaded discussions and so on. The other half is an immersive video game-like environment where you have to, in order to be successful in the game, you have to use original historical resources and then pull knowledge from them and, and send it to your teacher and so on. And so it's sort of this combination, this hybrid, you know, traditional online course, video game course. Kids, as you can imagine, are quite engaged. They're learning tons and so on. The interactivity that's now being embedded in electronic books and textbooks is incredible, right? It's not just words on paper anymore with a few static pictures or a static map. Now, inside that thing are embedded you know, interactive charts and diagrams. You know, the maps are interactive. Um, the graphs are interactive. You, know, you pop up a simulation or a game or a video right within the textbook or whatever. The learning resources that are, made, that are powerful here are just incredible. So we have this whole ecosystem that's emerging of active and interactive uh, learning resources. And we as educators are starting to play as well. So for example, 
this is a fairly static one, but again, this idea that this is a writing prompt website where I think this is John Spencer's site, right? He creates writing prompts that other teachers can use or contribute to. They look like this, right? So here's your writing prompt for the day to get kids interested in writing. So kick off your class with one of these, do some short writes and so on. And you can see that educators can contribute to these <coughs> and give kids things to think about and write about and so on, right? right? But they don't have to be, right? So this is some relatively static multimedia. But then we have more interactive stuff. So for example, here's science discrepant events. The idea is to create sort of anticipatory prompt, a quick teaser on some scientific content concept, and then figure out you know, what's going on here. So like, watch this. Right? You get the idea, right? So it gets you thinking. Here's Dan Meyer. He does the same thing with math. So he's got photo prompts and video prompts where, like, you know, let's frame things in terms of inquiry and questions that kids could ask themselves and then figure out what could you do with this, right? And then so rather than teaching kids road procedures they don't really understand, let's create video and, and, and image prompts that prompt kids to think about the underlying conceptual understanding and then they have to learn the formulas and learn how it works in order to solidify and actually tap into what's actually occurring in their real world and so on, and right? So they've got videos about, you know, things at the grocery store and pencil sharpeners and how long it's going to take this bucket to fill up and, you know, candle lighting and so on. It's all good stuff. So people, again, are contributing to these spaces. So you think about this idea of open, accessible, and free. You think about the fact that not just, it's not just static materials, but it's also you know, interactive and, and active materials that you can really sink your teeth into. How well are you doing in your classrooms at A, tapping into these materials, and B, maybe making some of these materials? I'll give you a couple minutes. Go. All right. So here's the cool thing. It's not just adults that have this power. Our students have this power. The fascinating part about this era that we now live in is that when we put powerful tools in the hands of youth, and when we get out of their way, adults, when we get out of their way, <laughs> amazing things can happen. What we're finding is that our kids can do things we never knew they could do because we never had the tools to give them. Now we're finding that we can give tools to them and amazing stuff happens, right? So I'm thinking about the virtual reality project in Iowa where we're giving middle school and high school kids the same kind of virtual reality software that's used by uh, aerospace engineers at Rockwell Collins. Right, we've got seventh graders using Blender and other tools. They're making working simulations of the human heart. They're making 3D working simulations of Da Vinci's diagrams with the gears turning and whatever. We've got special needs students who um, you know, have been disengaged from, from class in the past, and now they're creating realistic you know, ballistic simulations of their favorite rifle, and they're pouring through technical manuals this, this high to make sure that the gravitational pull and the rotation through the barrel and so on, everything is exactly accurate and precise. These are the kinds of things that we can make happen. Thinking about the Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia, where they've got an enterprising science teacher working with kids. They made a bio di biofuel diesel generator um, that, they're now, that they've been piloting in Guatemala. They've taken two villages in Guatemala from four hours of electricity a day to 20 hours of electricity a day. That's real world, authentic work. When we give kids meaningful, powerful tasks and we give them meaningful, powerful tools, the kinds of things they can do will amaze us on a regular basis. Right? And so there's all kinds of things that we can do in classes to give kids authentic voice and agency, ownership over their own working. Kathy Cassidy takes her six-year-olds, and they each have their own blog, right? And so they do things like finding 2D shapes, and here's my video, my understanding of the or sound, and here's my imaginary story, and I can't spell worth a darn, but... Uh, you know, you can kind of tell <laughs> what they're saying. So they give it to you, and people interact with them, right? So they have people who read and comment and so on. They're starting to internalize what it means to write for global audiences. This is a quad blogging project. Quad blogging is where you have four classrooms working together from four different schools. Each week, one school's, one class's students write. The other three classes' students interact and comment and give feedback. Then they rotate, and the next week it's a different class. That class is writing. Three other classes are interacting feedback. There's all kinds of cool ways 
just to tap into student voice. Uh, this is Youth Voices. It's actually a platform sponsored by Adobe that fosters youth connecting and interacting together. This is the literature and inquiry strand of Youth Voices where students can think about, you know, um, current events, they can throw out original writings like poems and short stories that they write, they can get feedback from peers around the world. You know, it's an interactive dialogue and discussion space around literature and so on, it's very cool. Um, and then we have kids who are starting to take this power on themselves. They're not waiting for the schools to empower them, they're just taking it on themselves. So for example, here's a video from Native American students uh, after ABC showed a, showed a special that was sort of critical of Native American reservation schools and highlighted poverty and crime and drug use and so on. And so they came back with a response video that said, you know what, we live in these communities. We are more than that. And they expressed their voice in a way that's quite powerful. Hang on. You get the idea. Um, here's an elementary kid who started a school lunch blog where every day she took a picture of her school lunch and she blogged about it, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's called Never Seconds, and the crazy thing about it is that she started attracting the attention of people around. So for example, here's a picture of her lunch, right? And she rates it, today my lunch is baked potato and cheese. And look, on the foodometer, that was a six out of 10. It took me 48 mouthfuls, uh, and pieces of hair, zero. <laughs> so that's good, right? <laughs> right? But she started attracting the attention of her local school system uh, because, you know, among other things, chefs like Jamie Oliver sort of caught on and started publicizing what she was doing. And her school initially tried to shut her down, right? They said, you cannot bring a camera to school. And then the public ridicule over that was so great that they allowed her to start doing that again and blogging about her lunches. And what this elementary kid did was she sparked a conversation about the quality of lunches that were going on. And now they're more nutritional, they're more healthful, they you know, still don't have any hair and all that. It's all good. Um, and you know, now she's expanded out. So she's got international school kids, like here's you know, a post from India where they're sharing what they eat in other locations, right? So here's what we eat in India. This was submitted by you know, the student Harshi. So you know, she created this whole international community around school lunches. And apparently school lunches is a big deal these days because the new federal guidelines. I gave up so, on two ago. I know I'm trying right? to so these teenagers made a video criticizing the new health guidelines for the federal school lunch program. Because they say we're not getting enough food, there's not enough caloric calories there. <laughs> we are hungry, right? Million views, million views and counting. Um, Here's Kevin Kerwick, teenager in Osseo, Minnesota. He started tweeting out, just didn't really even tell anybody about nice things that were happening in the school, acts of kindness by students to each other, sort of the anti-bullying strand that we, hear, you know, that we hear about so often. So you know, here's a news story writing about his efforts. He's on the football team. And he was like, look, I just thought it was important to share the good things that were going out there. And that's kind of cool, right? These kids have voices. Here's a Richard's Rwanda. It was a website founded by an 11-year-old girl named Jessica. Uh, she met a man from Rwanda who was asking about girls' education in Rwanda, was horrified by what she found out, started raising money for school supplies for girls. Pretty soon that morphed into this huge international project. So you can see over here on the right, you know, we've got a matching grant. We're up to $50,000 now that we're working with. You know, on her main blog, you can see she goes over there occasionally and visits girls over there. You know, and she takes people with her to interact with her. You know, started by a girl who was 11. Uh, then there's this kid, right? This kid cracks me up. He decided to do his project in Minecraft. For those of you who don't know how Minecraft works, it's kind of like virtual Legos, right? Where you can build things one block at a time. So uh, here's his project that he decided to do on his own. Sometimes known as that Ferguson kid. And today I'm here to show you my project in Minecraft. It's a history strip geography project. And what the task was is to either draw or describe a self-sustainable town. 
I found the idea quite boring, so I decided to do it in Minecraft. She wanted me to draw a poster, and that sounded boring. So I decided to do Minecraft instead. Here we go. Here we go. Remember, one block at a time. Coming up here on the right is the agriculture village. This will be essential for the town's food supply. There are three houses and one storehouse with wheat seeds, pumpkin seeds, water, some produce. Right? I mean, you get the idea. So, drawing a poster. We would have asked this kid to do something that took an hour and a half worth of work. He said, that's stupid, that's boring, I know how to do this instead. And he probably spent, who knows, hundreds of hours working on this 3D virtual world, complete with, you know, animals, cows, and sheep, and wheat seed storage bins, and, and buildings, and so on, right? There's a whole, you know, 13-minute video of, of it all. It's kind of incredible. Um, and the idea here is that the heck with Khan Academy, the heck with adults making math tutorial videos that kids can watch passively. We don't live in that broadcast transmission world anymore where we push out information and they passively receive it. Let's put our kids to work, right? Here's uh, student-made math movies where they make their own math movies, right? And they can pull up there, let's pull up, um, ooh, let's see. Uh, they're not showing up today for some reason, I don't know. But the idea is that these kids make these math tutorial videos where they explain math concepts. You can imagine taking a kid, taking your classroom and saying, look, I'm not going to make you watch some adult's explanatory video. Here's what you're going to do. Take something that you struggled with over the last two weeks in this math unit, and over the weekend or on Monday, what we're going to do is we're, you're going to make your own video explaining that concept because now you've got it in a way that better explains it, makes it easier and faster for the next kid to learn next year. Let, show me on Monday what you got. Right? I'm going to learn from you. We're going to learn from each other. By the way, we're building a collection of resources that we can use. It's youth voice to youth voice, and so on. And we're solidifying those kids' learning because it was a concept that they struggled with, and now they have to actually teach others through the use of video. This is what we can do that's so much better than the Khan Academy. Right? Instead of uh, book reviews on Amazon or from professionals, heck, have kids do book reviews. Right? Here's the uh, Oak Ridge Elementary uh, book review blog. Right? Oak Ridge Reads. That's kind of cool. Instead of seeing these commercial book trailers, like movie trailers, but they're for books where the author and the publishing company makes them, have kids make book trailers. Sure, why not? Uh, let's see. What's this one that didn't load? Let's try that one again. Nope, don't know what that one is, so we'll skip it. Uh, what was that? Yeah, that's all right. OK, right? So and we have to start thinking more globally when we do this and recognize that our kids can make value, right? So I'm going to skip that one. Um, you know, here's a story on seventh graders who published an iBook for an Apple iPad. On, and uh, it was on local flora and fauna in Florida. It was the best seller in the nature category on iTunes for several weeks, right? A book created by seventh graders. That's kind of cool, and so on. And the point here is that, you know, they shouldn't just be playing apps. They can make apps. Instead of watching and consuming, they can be making and creating. The power that our kids have at their disposal these days is unprecedented. Student voice, student agency. We have the ability to empower those in ways that we've never been able to do before. With your neighbor, take a couple minutes and talk about how well are you doing at enabling student voice and student agency and ownership of their learning. What powerful things could your kids be doing if you got out of their way and gave them some tools to do it? Go.